Divine wins, did they intervene in the lives of the people of the Bible? No, not just the people of the Bible, but we find in history on a couple of different occasions of the divine wind interfering in the lives of the children of the sun of the ancient Japanese, as they called themselves. We find Japan was a small nation in the beginning. They were occupying the islands that now known as Japan. Their very lives and culture were under a constant threat from China and Korea. Where did they get their knowledge to make the greatest swords in the world? Still today, they, I believe, are superior to anything else which have been handed down from father and son. If we go possibly to the books of Enoch that has been rejected by the church world, even though Enoch is spoken of in our Old Testament, he tells very interesting stories and names the names of extraterrestrials that were intervening in the lives of and teaching men on this planet to make swords and war. Because I know that there's a lot of different people that talk about back in Genesis when these fallen angels, they call them, in other words, extraterrestrials who had lost their first estate, the Jude of the very small book next to the last book of the Bible of Revelation. It tells about these extraterrestrials that came down onto this earth and they saw the daughters of men and they found them fair and they decided to take unto themselves wives. And people said, who were these people? Now I believe that many of these extraterrestrials, they were to mix in with many of the different races and nations of this world. And we're going to go to a small example as to how and why and and what they did to interfere with the lives of men. We know that there are several different ethnic types and tribes of Asiatics who migrated out of China, Mongolia, and Korea, uh, who went by ship to the Japanese islands, probably to escape the cruel warlords on the mainland. Was it in the dim past on the mainland that they learned their art of sword making and the skill of war? We know that if their new country was, to, or well, let's say, I mean to say, if they knew that if their country was to survive, they would have to impose real discipline or disciplinary action, let's say, upon themselves and their people in order to survive, as they knew that the evil warlords would follow them in time. I would like to quote to you from R. H. Charles' Book of Enoch in part from a couple of pages uh, 34 and 35. Now I want the listener to bear with me. I do not profess to be fluent in all of the ancient languages and I'm sure that there will be those out there that will say that I butcher it because a lot of these uh, names that we will use and so forth I'm not familiar with as I do not use them in my everyday speech and so at times I'll be the first to confess that I have some difficulty with them and you may want to go and get your own books of Enoch and research it for yourself and see what conclusion that you come up with so we find on page 34 he titles this the fall of the angels the demoralization of mankind and if you look in your concordance there there's 27 different types of man listed under mankind and those of the most ancient antiquity they were called Enosh men. And also the word Ish, it, it means a mankind, not always pertaining particularly to an Israelite. And he goes on to say that the intercession of these angels on the behalf of mankind, he tells of the dooms pronounced by the God on the angels and the Messianic kingdom. And he said this is from a fragment of Noah. Now, in all possibility, I must say at the outset that I feel that this is talking possibly about something that took place in the ancient past, more ancient than we even suspect on, uh, in what they would call the church will renders the pre-Diluvian age before the great flood, which uh, in future tapes we're going to prove was a great intergalactic war that took place several thousand years ago. Now, this could have been a prophecy for a future date, but I don't think so. I think it's talking about something from great antiquity 
and we can't help but wonder now we're not picking on the Japanese or the Chinese or any particular race because every race on the nation of this earth we would have to classify them as a fallen race we've fallen from grace we've all fallen and left our uh, first estate as Jude has said and so we're all pilgrims here upon this planet and we're trying to find the answers as to why we're here and from where we came and shall we return which seems very evident that the great predominance of the people on this planet will one day return to their own homes now we continue on quoting from this book of Enoch and it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied in those days and were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters and the angels the children of heaven now let's keep in mind that means outer space they saw and they lusted after them and they said one to another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And this one of the head perpetrators, and it says, And Samajaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this, and I alone will have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath, and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecation as to abandon, as not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. They swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecation upon it. And they were in all two hundred who descended in the days of Jarad on the summit of Mount Hermon. Now we find even that uh, mentioned in the Bible but and it's also been corrupted and changed but I believe that due to the translators that also deciphered and translated this Enoch they didn't understand it either uh, so I believe they butchered it but I think it was speaking uh, uh, from a planet that's trying to tell us of a place in space their original home and where they descended to and where this took place but at the time it will remain a mystery to us and they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn they bound themselves together by mutual imprecation upon it and these are the names of the leader or the leaders semi Zaza their leader Archiba Ramiel Kokabel now, it sounds very much like there's a possibility here that when we spoke of uh, the great days of antiquity in South America, we find that way back in the antiquity they talked about one called Cuckoo Khan who came there. And is there a similarity here, only a change in the language? Well, it's something to think about. It goes on. Another one of them was called Tamiel, Ramiel, Daniel. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, Bar, a Bar a Quajal, Ashda, uh, uh, Ashael, uh, Armoros, Batarel, Anael, Zequiel, Sam Zapel. Satar El, Tor El, jo, Jom Ja El. I'm sure that in the ancient language that was the <clears throat> why it was very much silent, like a lot of the Swedes would say Jan, like Jan Jan Jansen, and the J would be silent. But we can, we'll just go along with whatever the what we think the English understanding would be. Then he mentions another, uh, Sar Ayel. These are the chiefs of the tens, and all the others together with them look unto the, took unto themselves wives, each chose for himself one, and then they begin to go into them, to defile themselves with them, and they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them equated with plants. Now, when we look for confirmation of this, we go back into the Old Testament and it talks about and giants were born unto them. Well, it was a corruption where in the original, <coughs> excuse me, it spoke of the 
It said the great men of renown. In other words, out of them were to come these sons who were to be future rulers or cons or kings. And these uh, were great men of renown. And so I think we can trace that as our Bible tells us that this goes back into the great days of antiquity uh, before the flood. And this probably took place on some other planet. And is it possible that some of their descendants were sent here? Well, there's a lot of speculation that we can only talk about, but we find out that a lot of this was carried on, although there was a great name change, that they were revered in Babylon and even in Egypt and so forth, that on the other side of the flood that they were nothing but a bunch of corrupt politicians, uh, judges, and those dabbling in a and a sacrilegious priestcraft, but then on the other side of the flood they became venerated and they were raised to the statue of gods. We find that the Orientals, they have been uh, great herbalists from the time of mortal, and we find that they were great gardeners. We would have you check the chapter of dragon ships about the intervention into their lives and so forth. It ties in with this and many others that we see that these great men of antiquity, how they affected the earth men. And they affected the lives of people apparently on other planets that caused them to be cast here to this earth. And it goes on to say, And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of anatomy and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones, all coloring tinctures. And there rose such uh, rose much godly, godlessness, and they committed fornication. They were led astray and become corrupt in all of their ways. Samajaza taught enchantments and root cutting. Amaros, the resolving of enchantments. And Bara Gil... Yael goes on to tell us that he taught astrology. Kokabal, the constellation. Ezoquel, the knowledge of the clouds. Now, right there we know that this was in great antiquity and we have a chapter that <clears throat> you might have already heard that speaks of the cloud or what is talking about the cloud ships, the ships that flew in the clouds. And it's quite obvious here how else uh, these were men of flesh and blood. How else could they have fornicated with these women from another planet? And then we find uh, Aragwell, the signs of the earth. Sam Sael, the signs of the sun, and Sariel, the course of the moon. And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to the heaven. And then Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel, they looked down from heaven, and they saw much blood shed upon the earth, and all lawlessness what being wrought upon the earth. And they said one to another, The earth made without in inhabitant cries the voice of their crying up to the gates of heaven. And now to you, the holy ones of heaven, the souls of men, make their suit, saying, Bring our cause before the Most High. <clears throat> and they said to the Lord of ages, our Bible, uh, we call him the uh, Ancient of Days, goes on to say, The Lord of lords, the God of gods, King of kings, and the God of the ages, the throne of thy, hope, thy glory standeth. Well, we've discussed this in the past, talking about something that's glorious, that standeth in space. And they were crying unto what uh, later on in our Bible we call the Mount Zion, that we said was the space station, Lucifer. And unto all the generations of the age, and thy name holy and glory, and blessed unto all ages, thou hast made all things and power over all things. Hast thou, and all things are naked and open in thy sight, and all things thou seest, and nothing can hide itself from thee. Thou seest that Azazel hath done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth, and has revealed the eternal secrets 
which were preserved in heaven, which men were striving to learn. Now Sama Jaza, to whom thou hast given authority to bear rule over his associates, they have gone to the daughters of men upon the earth, but we don't know exactly which earth. And they have slept with the women, they've defiled themselves, they revealed to them all kinds of sins. Now the women were born giants, and the whole earth thereby being filled with blood and unrighteousness. And now behold, the souls of those who have died are crying and making their suit to the gates of heaven, and their lamentations have ascended and cannot cease because of the lawless deeds which are wrought upon the earth. Now the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel to him, ascribed all sins and to Gabriel said the Lord proceed against the bastards and the reprobates and against the children of fornication and destroy these children of fornication and the children of the watchers from among men and cause them to go forth and send them one against the other that they may destroy each other in battle now this may confuse some people because all watchers are not bad it's like uh, this extraterrestrial heavenly police force that it's just like a, a police force here in a state or a county uh, we find occasionally a corrupt policemen now was this where they got the word samurai a corruption of the word uh, Shamzael were they the great sam samurai warriors that taught war and sword making uh, were they the ones, these extraterrestrials, that taught it to these earth men? Were the ancient ones, where they they talked about the warlords of space, were they not the ones that come down and taught it to these earth men? We find in many of the other chapters of the book, we prove that mounts were the ships of extraterrestrial origin, the angels or the messengers and watchers that rode in and to earth plane. This last paragraph that we just read, it tells us, that fallen or corrupt watchers of extraterrestrial origin. They crossbred with all the different peoples of the earth, and this is why he sent the good guys in to destroy the evil ones from earth that were vexing all of mankind. Note he taught them to make swords and knives and armor like the ancient samurai warrior was to wear, and we're not saying that they were all evil men. They were just taught by evil messengers. They were taught some good things, such as herbs and etc. But we know Enoch said that all of this took place before the flood, or so we assume that it did. And was it carried over here? Uh, uh, is this some proof here that these a lot of these a Asian people, or Oriental, if you like, that they preceded the Semitic man by many centuries here, and they were corrupted by these fallen extraterrestrials for this Adam type man ever appeared we have the history of the great Spanish Armada being wiped out by sudden winds and storms as they went after their other Christian nations of Europe Japan had its share of intervention by divine winds which they call kamikaze Japan has never been successfully invaded the sea was its moat now, there were two great attempts by the Chinese mainland in the 13th century to invade the island of Japan. And at that time of the Second World War, there were plans by the Americans to uh, invade the land by sea, but they abandoned, when, they abandoned this when Japan surrendered. We all know that Japan used suicide pilots in the Second World War, and they adopted this legend, uh, legendary title here, Kamikaze, which means... <clears throat> divine wind hoping to imitate the great storms that the that defeated the mongols twice in the year of 1274 and again in 1281 as we've pointed out in these other chapters that the mongols came forth uh of the land of nud and the uh, uh well a lot of people call it nod which is a misspelling mistranslation but enoch tells us that it was nud as the ancient writings of Enoch call China uh, <clears throat> a nod by your King James Bible and some other versions, and Frar Fenton said it was the land of exile. Isn't that odd? Nod is used only once in your Bible, and Strong's Concordance shows us that it was 
N-O-W-D pronounced nodi, changed to nod. Now the Japanese historians, they offer great detailed accounts of the Mongol evasions against their nations when they were launched by that infamous personage called Kublai Khan. The reader or listener, you might say, here is probably saying, what has this got to do with the Bible accounts of UFO and why were they protecting Japan? The extraterrestrial messengers of the God of Israel, we shall prove later as we believe that the succession of uh, emperors of China, they were possibly the descendants of extraterrestrial hosts of Enoch and Genesis, uh, vexing the earth and men. And this is why the divine intervention on behalf of Japan and Europe against the uh, Spanish Armada a few centuries later. In 1200, 68, Kublai Khan, he conquered northern China and Korea. Then Khan demanded submission by Japan. We find in the old 1917 encyclopedia, Khan was spelled Kain, K-A-A-N. Some explain that the Khans were descendants of Cain. It was, now remember, we know that, as we said, Cain was driven off the face of the earth which seems very confusing. He was driven off of his original habitation, and he ended up here. So there seems to be a great tie-in. So in 1274, Khan, he prepared to launch a great armada to invade this Japanese island stronghold, and it was November of 1274. He, he launched a fleet of 900 ships and 40,000 Mongol, uh, Chinese, and Korean troops, and they landed at Kai... K-Y-U-S-H-U-S H-A-K-A-T-A Kaisu's Hakata Bay. Now it was after the first day of successful combat. These invaders, they retired for the night. But that night a storm came up and it threatened this uh, great fleet at anchor, forcing the ship's captains to put out to sea. The storm overtook the fleet, sinking 200 ships and bringing the total loss of life uh, to approximately 13,500. Now, some counts say uh, more and some say less. So we find that old Khan figured that the cost was no object, especially when you're sitting at home with a palace full of honeys, plenty of rice and wine, and probably thinking, there, here's a solution to the population explosion. So he prepared a greater armada. This time he sent out 4,400 ships and 142,000 Mongols, Chinese, and Korean troops. They came from ports in China and Korea for the second assault on Japan. It was the largest armada that was ever assembled in the history of man, even up until the Second World War. Uh, by comparison, three centuries later, the Spanish armada which was comprised of 130 ships and 27,500 men. By the way, they lost to great winds and driving storms. Uh, we find now going back to Japanese, they figured there'd be a second attack, which was to come, and it did, seven years later. In the meantime, they didn't set idle. They built a wall all around uh, uh, Hakata Bay, and they built a massive structure that was approximately 2.5 meters high and 20 kilometers long. We find the Mongolian hordes of Khan. They apparently had no advanced knowledge of this great wall. And they landed their advanced proportion of their, uh, or advanced portion of their army directly in front of it. Now these close quarters that really messed up their most successful tactics, which were due to the lightning charge of their cavalry, which they'd used successfully to rout the finest armies of Asia and Eastern Europe. The two armies were closely matched in numbers and ability, and we find that the skirmish had raged around uh, Hakata Bay, in which uh, neither side seemed to be able to gain the advantage. Then the invaders, they reboarded their ships. The morale was kind of low at this time, I would imagine. Uh, then sailing westward, they joined the main body of the army, which had finally arrived after a two-month delay in China. Finally, they got their ships and all troops assembled along about July, and their combined forces, they decided, that, and uh, they would go ahead and they attacked uh, Takashima. 
uh, Takashima, I mean to say, and they prepared to invade uh, the mainland of Kaishu. Meanwhile, the emperor and the other high-ranking officials, they decided they needed a little divine help, and they besought the aid of their gods. They performed elaborate uh, uh, Shentu ceremonies at shrines throughout the country on the behalf of their defending army. And as in answer to their prayer, the kamikaze, or the divine wind, struck the Takashima area in August with great devastating effects. Uh, the estimates of the Mongolian losses vary, but most accounts set the ships that were sunk at approximately 4,000. The troop casualty probably exceeded over 100,000. That's estimated by the uh, biggest part of your historians that I would put faith in, uh, including those that drowned in sea and others that were slaughtered by the Jack, uh, Japanese at uh, Takashima. The Mongols never seriously threatened Japan again. There will possibly be a great outcry from the religious world. That was just a coincidence. But let's go back and read Enoch again. It tells us of the cries of men going up to heaven to deliver them from evil men. Remember the Almighty said, I will love whom I will love, and I choose whom I will choose. Now we have a great uh, deal of evidence of divine uh, winds in the book of the Apocrypha. You find in the Geneva Bible and the older King James, they are now putting back into them some of the newer reprinted Bibles. Uh, now we're stuck. Well, for those of you who may not understand, we're talking about the 14 books of the Apocrypha. And so I figured they were good enough for the pilgrims and Martin Luther and the others, and they're good enough for me. And we find they're still full of prophecies, which is being fulfilled in our day. And if you'll see in other uh, chapters, as we'll call them, or tapes, you'll be able to understand in our day, because of the unfolding of the light of today's technology, that these books, I would say, they were right on course. Let's look at some of the apocryphal scriptures. There's a concordance written just for the Apocrypha, which is published by Erdman's Publishing Company in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's lauded by David M. Uh, uh, Scholler of the Northern Baptist Theological Seminary, and etc. And they, several of them here, they go on to say that this concordance should be in the library of every uh, serious student. So we find that uh, the Baptist Theological Seminaries and many of the others, they they think there's something to it, so uh, this ought to give us a little reassurance in case our local preacher, the old sheep shed, has said it was a no-no. First, we would quote to you from Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, 39th chapter, 28 to 29. There be winds that are created for vengeance, and in their fury lay on their Gorgian heavenly. In the time of the consummation, they will pour out their strength. They shall appease the wrath of him that made them. Fire and hail and famine and death, all of these created for vengeance. Although I'm not a big fan of the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, but in this case they got it right. Uh, Whereas the American version translated the word winds wrongly using old King James air of spirits. These so-called winds of great extraterrestrial ships, I believe, that create the winds. Now notice they shoot or they make fire and hail. They cause famine and death. We would have you see our chapters on fire out of heaven. And the hail is possibly caused by the great speed of these oscillating, rotating ships which changed the upper atmospheric conditions, lowering the temperature to the point that it would create hail. Now we've all wondered uh, what really happened when the three boys were thrown in the fiery furnace of Daniel 1, 6-7. Now among those were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Heniah, Michael, and Azariah unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave them names after he <clears throat> gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar and to Hanai of Shadrach and to Michael of uh, Meshach and to Azariah uh, Abednego. 
Now we find that a lot of people have assumed that this was their names, but they were changed, and we won't go into the meaning of all this. Now, this sounds like something off the wall that I dreamed of, trying to connect them to the apocryphal writings. It was a Revised Standard Version Apocrypha that referred me to Daniel 1, 6-7, showing the song of the three holy children is supposed to be added to Daniel. Here's a description of how and who saved them. Uh, and this is that it, it appears at a wind-making machine here. A cherubim, which we learned, was a small shuttlecraft, which was dispatched by the Almighty and the larger craft overhead. I suspect that the furnace was a large open uh, mouth graven image to the pagan god Moloch. Uh, it was big enough for some extraterrestrial craft to fly into, as we will learn from. Uh, let us quote now from the Three Holy Children, uh, chapter 1, 23 to 34. And the king's servant that put them in ceased not to make the flames hot with naphtha, pitch, uh, tow, and small wood, so that the flames... Uh, uh, the flame has screamed forth from the furnace forty and nine cubits, and it spread and burned those uh, uh, Chaldeans or Chaldeans uh, whom it found about the furnace. And the angel of the Lord came down into the furnace together with Azarias and his fellows, and he smote the flame of the fire out of the furnace and made to the midst of the furnace as it had been a moist whistling wind, so that the fire touched them not on either, hurt nor troubled them. And the three, as out of one mouth, praised and glorified and blessed God in the furnace, saying, Blessed art thou, O Lord, the God of our fathers, to be praised and exalted above all and forever. And blessed be thy glorious and holy name to be praised and to be exalted above all. Blessed art thou in the temple of thy holy glory. See, they knew where it was, but our so-called Christendom, religious world, they, does, they don't know. And to be praised and glorified above all forever, blessed art thou that beholdest the depths and setteth upon the cherubim. And to be praised and exalted above forever, blessed art thou the throne of thy kingdom. And to be praised and exalted above all forever, blessed art thou in the firmament of heaven and be praised and glorified forever. The firmament there is talking about this uh, other world we call Venus, so-called planet. The firmament is referring, as many other places, talking about the clouds that are about it that's still a mystery to our religious and scientific world. We find the 27th verse tells of moist winds created by the ship accounting for the clouds around the extraterrestrial ship. Verse 32 tells the Almighty's uh, ship sitting above, and the boys were praising the angels, their messengers, and the ship. Verse 27 describes it as a moist, whistling wind which protected them from the fire. Let's go to another divine wind, the New Testament. As we go to Acts 27:14 in the King James, it tells of St. Paul on his way to Rome to be put on trial in front of Caesar, but appears that the Almighty wanted Paul to stop off on a little island called Malta. Even though they referred to them as a barbarous people, in Acts 28.1, the Almighty wanted Paul to teach them. In the 14th verse, But long after, it says there rose against them a tempest wind called Erochodon. The uh, It's E-U-R-O-C-L-Y-D-O-N. Now, the only time this word is used in the Old uh, or New Testament... Uh, it's used only in the New Testament, I mean to say. We see that Strong's Concordance says it's pronounced Y-U-R-O-C-L-I-D-O-N. U rock ladon. Here we have a cue, or a clue, I mean to say. We see that the part of a word, rock, was this describing a type of rocket ship. Then Strong goes haywire on us. He shows us how the ancient writer, uh, uh, and then uh, we show that the ancient writings of India, they spoke of rockets, and the Apocrypha and King Solomon, they speak of the use in the future that are to come out of stone silos, as we will deal in our other chapter that's entitled Star Wars. Strong's Concordance, uh, 2148, they put uh, uh, a little star beside this word, which calls attention to the fact that the text quoted the leading word, 
which has been changed to some other in the revised version. Why was it changed? Was it because the translators didn't understand the fire UFO? Uh, Dake's Bible footnotes has this to say. Uh, uh, T-U-P-H-O-N-I-K-O-S only here is an ancient term for an eastern storm which uh, moderns call a levanter, a typhoon, whirlwind, a hurricane blowing in all directions. Then he says the ship was caught in the hurricane and driven wherever the wind would take it. Now, isn't it odd how it was guided to the exact place that Paul was to go to? As we go to the Strong's Concordance of uh, Eurachodon, they said it was pronounced Eurachlidon. Then they switched to Sufa. As we've shown in other chapters, Sousa is an iron ship, a UFO with a driver, pilot inside. So here, what's the connection between an Asus and a Sufa? And we think it might be the difference between a cherubim and a seraphim, and I believe it was a very large ship used by the watchers, as the scriptures call them, such as the one that parted the Red Sea. And other chapters, we're told that the angels of the great Lord it speaks of him banking the pillar, and he looked through the cloud at the Egyptians. Now, back to the word that they replaced e Eurachodon with in Strong's Concordance. It was Z-E-K-A-R-Y-A-H-U-W and it's pronounced pro zik ar -ya, or zik ar -yahu. They give us a couple different words here in the concordance and Yah has remembered, one of them means. Another word used in place of wind is tempest, as in Job 27 and 20. Uh, tempest standeth him away in the night, and they send us to another word, uh, that uh, sofa, which means a kufa, suf, a prime root meaning to snatch away, terminate, consume, hence perish, be utterly uh be utterly, and he describes their ability to take you away or or destroy great earth armies. And then it goes on, it carries it farther, it describes a hurricane as we find Brother Paul in. They said the Red Sea and storm, tempest, whirlwind, Red Sea again. Apparently they use this here to describe the UFO Iraqidon, uh, making a whirlwind action, creating this great typhoon storm that drove the ship in a certain direction. And they say it's just a coincidence, like the wind that just came up to send Jonah in the right direction, like the coincidental winds at the exact time seven years apart uh, with dealing with the Japanese. Now, the proof is the wind was not accidental, but it was created by somebody with intelligence and of extraterrestrial origin, not mystical, esoteric, or magic means. They had been at sea several days, like Jonah. St. Paul says, Don't sweat it, in verse 22. Now I exhort you, be of good cheer. For there will be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Verse 23, For there stood by me this night the angel or the messenger of God, who I am and whom I serve. How did the angel get on board? Dr. Spock, was he beamed up or down? Wouldn't you think something, uh, wouldn't you think stood would be a simple word, but like the angel is stood by Paul. With the Greek, we're not sure. They give us a bunch of possibilities. So, without going into all of those, stand, uh, they go in, they give you the word par is timey. It means like something stand beside, some type of hovercraft, like a saucer ship, able to stand up on high winds. You may want to look that up in your strong words 3936. And then they give us another word to look up, uh, 2476. It means to be at a stand, stand by, still up. And the word there is histe me. It means to be staunch, stand up, by, stand for, still up. This is just a couple of the Greek explanations of what appears to be a hovering giant ship that can create great winds. There's a second century explanation of one of these extraterrestrial personages off this craft. It was entitled Messengers Angelos in 2 B.C. Manuscript Envoys, whose name were given the verb form meaning to proclaim. Thus the word refers to a messenger who is an envoy bearing a message. The Greek word came into English and the word angel and is so given in the proper context in the New Testament, which is masculine relative pronoun in the original translate who. 
end of quote on that. So, we find many mysteries unfolding throughout our scriptures and things that the churches have not dealt with and it speaks of great lands and cataleptic upheavals and disturbance of the oceans and along the shorelines of the latter days and we'll keep these in mind and if you care to receive any more of our tapes be sure and write to Noah Frederick's Pilgrim Ships P.O. Box 1086 Lakeview, Missouri 65737 and we thank you for listening